Today we're going to talk about triple integration or triple integrals. So instead of doing just double integrals, we're doing triple now. Whereas double integrals integrated over a region had their uh, their domain of integration, a region in the plane. Now we're doing triple integration, and our domain of integration that we're going to integrate over the inputs are going to be in three space. So similar to the way that you can integrate. Uh, the area differential of a region in space and get, or in the plane rather, and get the area of that region. When we're working with triple integrals, we can integrate the volume differential over a region in space, and that's going to give us the volume of that region, that solid region in space now. And uh, I didn't type it out anywhere, but you know, the area differential is in whichever order you choose to integrate dy dx and the volume differentials dx, dy, dz, like that. So to start off with, let's try and find the volume of a region in space using a triple integral. You could also do this with a double integral as we've seen in the past, but let's try with a triple integral. So we wanna find the region uh, that is bounded between the paraboloids z is equal to x squared plus y squared and z is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared. So we have a question to answer. What order should we try and integrate these things in? Well, typically if you're given something in terms of z is equal to f of x, then you can find the minimum and maximum um, z values relatively easily. So let me just kind of give you a um, sort of a spoiler to what we're gonna do here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna integrate. We're gonna create a lot of these little vertical slices from the top of the red parabola down to the blue, bottom of the blue one. And they're all gonna be related to these XY regions or XY points in the plane. And so that kind of vertical slice that I drew right there is related to that little kind of point in the plane. And so if we let those points vary along the x and the y direction will generate kind of whole slices of area between these two curves above this uh, input line in the plane. And as we let that input line vary, we'll generate the entire volume. So it was a little bit hand wavy and we'll see a good example of this later, but for now, let's just head forward. So the max of that is gonna be on the top paraboloid, which is the red one given by uh, four minus x squared minus y squared. And the minimum, is going to be of our z height direction is going to be that blue paraboloid z is equal to x squared plus y squared. Now for any fixed point in the plane, which we can see we've drawn a fixed point in the plane over there, we're going to get a unique segment connecting those points uh, between the upper and the lower um, bound of our, our region here. So, so far we have that our heights are going to be given by the lower boundary of z is equal to x squared plus y squared, that blue parabola. And then the upper one is given by z is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared, that, that uh, upper parabola. And notice instead of having dv now, I replace dv with dz, right? Those, this, different, this differential is related to those limits as we've seen before. And now there's dA, well, that's dx dy. And that's what we've been seeing before. That's a double integral like we've done. And there's nothing different from what we're doing right now to that concept of a double integration that we've seen before. So again, so far, this is what we have. And now we need to let X and Y vary. And where do we need to let them vary for? Well, we need to let them vary uh, across that entire projection, the shade area of that our region would cast if we were to shine a light and it were to, to shine the shade straight down on that XY plane. So call that the projection of our region in space onto the XY plane. And this is just a double integral like we've done before. So what I mean by that is we're now only interested in, let's see, we're only interested in this shaded region, setting up the integral, the outer part of those integrals. Right, here we go. I used green last time to highlight dA. Sorry, I've got my highlighter in big mode here. And that's gonna be related to that region in the plane. So let's go ahead and set up the double integral. Okay, so now which way do we want to set this up? Well, 
You could do this either way you like to, uh, however you want. But first things first, whether you want to do X or Y first, the first things first, we have to figure out what does that shade, how can we represent that shaded region uh, just in terms of X, Y? And so to figure that out, the shade, the, the shade is going to get casted down onto the, the plane at the intersection, kind of the widest part of that sort of egg-shaped solid. If you look at the picture, you can see that, sure enough, if we were to cast this straight down, it's going to be this boundary. That boundary right there is what's going to get casted down right there and all the shaded pits within it. So for that reason, in order to find the x and y limits in, of integration, we have to find the intersection of our surfaces. And so to do that, we'll set z is equal to zero. And so we'll have x squared plus y squared is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared. Go ahead and add every all the negative values to the right to get two x squared plus two y squared equals to four, factor out of two. Divide through, you're going to get x squared plus y squared is equal to two. And now it is totally up to you as to whether you want to set this thing up with vertical slices like that blue line I have driven uh, drawn suggests, or whether you want to go horizontal. That's fine too. It's either way will work. I tend to like to go vertical if I can. And so that's the way I'm going to proceed here. Okay, so if we're looking at that blue slice there, we're going to need to determine the height of that, but we need to determine. Hey, to generate this whole region, we have to let that thing vary. Where from? From here to here. And so, well, to help me figure out what that's going to be, I'm going to solve for y here in this little equation. Whoops, sorry about that. And we're going to get y squared is equal to square root of, of 2 minus x squared. Now you take the square root of, or uh, yes. Oh, I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Let me let me say that again. All right. So y squared is equal to two minus x squared. I'll go ahead and square root both sides. Get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of two minus x squared. A positive version of that is going to give us our upper hemisphere. The negative version is going to give us our lower hemisphere there. So, how far do we need to let um, x vary? Well, what do we know at this point right here? We know that y is zero. So uh, it's probably going to be easier just to plug in zero here and get zero squared plus y squared. Oops, we'll plug it in for y. Like I said, x plus zero squared is equal to two. That's going to give us x is equal to plus or minus root two. So this is root two along the x-axis, and that's negative root two along the x-axis. And thus, we have our x limits of integration. We want to let those vertical slices vary between plus and minus root two. So now we have to come up with the top and the bottom of these things. Well, that's where this, this little piece of math is going to help us out. That's going to provide us our y limits of integration. And we've done this before. y is equal to negative square root of two minus x squared. And up here, right there, we've got y is equal to positive two minus x squared. So y is going to vary between those two values. Okay, so we can put all of this together and uh, we've got our triple integral ready to go. What do we have so far? Well, we have those z limits of integration. So we'll start with our innermost integral. We have z is equal to x squared plus y squared and z is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared. We'll fill in our differential to match. And then the way we've set this up, give myself some room here to write, we want dy to be our middle uh, integral because y is going to vary between negative root 2 minus x squared and positive root 2 minus x squared. And then x is going to vary between x is equal to negative root 2 and x is equal to positive root 2. And we've done it. We've set this thing up. So the next task would be to try and compute this thing. Oops, I gave myself two pages there. So uh, let's start with the innermost integral. We'll start with the innermost integral. 
enter. All right, well, if you just leave the limits integration out of this, if you just integrate dz, you're gonna get z. And if we have limits integration, we're gonna evaluate it at those. So basically I just did this. Okay, so we got our lower limit of integration is gonna be z as we've got x squared plus y squared. And then we've got z is equal to four minus x squared minus y squared. And then continuing that logic down here, we are going to now plug in for z. So we're gonna get from the top, uh, four minus x squared minus y squared minus the bottom x squared plus y squared. All right, so we got equals to four minus x squared minus y squared minus x squared minus y squared. I do that all up to get four minus two x squared minus two y squared. And we've done it, we've done our innermost integral. So now what do we have? What do we have left? Well, we have our outer integral. X is equal to negative root two to positive root two. And then Y is equal to negative two minus X squared. Uh, and then to positive two minus X squared. And hopefully you're kind of watching me do this and think to your, thinking to yourself at this point, uh, hey, Brian, this doesn't seem like the best way to do this. Uh, because now we're basically, this is what we came from, what we've done before. This is a double integral that is best done most likely with polar coordinates. So spoiler alert, that's coming next, but I just wanted to show you, it's a nice example for how to set these things up and kind of start working their way through them. Um, and yeah, a good exercise for you, turning this thing into polar coordinates makes it much, much cleaner and easier to do. For now, we're going to put that on pause and talk about the general method of how to kind of attack these things. So for the limits in integration, and it, this doesn't have to be a volume integral, you know, we could just be interested in, you know, integrating some input uh, domain of some function. Maybe our function is f of x comma y comma z. You know, we can have z's in there because we're going to integrate with respect to z, three inputs, because we have our input space is three space dv. So this method applies to this too. But really, this is about how to find the limits of integration. So in general, if possible, I like to work with z first as the inner integral, because it kind of, you know, makes sense like we do. The height, we want to kind of put that inside and then work our way outside to X and Y. Once you get the innermost integral figured out though, now you're back to what we've been doing, setting up a double integral for those outer two integrals. And that's just gonna be the projection, the projected region of your solid onto whatever plane it's collapsing down on. If you do Z first, it's gonna be the X, Y plane. If you do X as your innermost uh, integral, then it's gonna be, the YZ plan that you're gonna collapse that, project that down onto. So that's what I mean by this, is you can do this in other orders and the setup's gonna be similar. And so we'll see an example of this too, or a couple of them. But first things first, let's, uh, let's have a look at an example. Let's try and find the volume between Z is equal to X squared plus three Y squared and Z is equal to eight minus X squared minus Y squared. So first things first, this is very similar to this, the first example we had. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know what? Let's try and do these vertical little line segments that we will then relate, we will let them vary all throughout our solid in this region, this projected region down below. So there's our X, Y related to that vertical slice. So which one is which here? Well, I don't have a blue highlighter but I do have a red highlighter and I've got the red on the bottom. And so the bottom is this, and then I'll just go ahead and write top for blue there to help us kind of think this through. So just like before, we'll start with our Z bounds. And so our Z top or Z max, if you will, is gonna be eight minus X squared minus Y squared. That's gonna dictate the, the top of that vertical little line segment there. And then Z bottom, if you will, is X squared plus 
3y squared. Okay, so now it's time to concern ourselves with this projection. What's this projection going to be? And so once again, the projection refers to the shadow this thing would cast down in the plane. And sorry, my highlighter is not perfect there, but it's just the highlighted shaded region. If we were to project this uh, region in space down onto one of the coordinate planes. Okay, so to figure that out, we need to find the intersection of our two um, bounding surfaces. So we're gonna have set those equal to each other x squared plus 3y squared is equal to 8 minus x squared minus y squared. Doing a little bit of math here, 2x squared plus 4y squared equals to 8. Uh, it's going to give us x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 4. And then dividing everything by 4, we're going to get an ellipse x squared over 4 plus y squared over two is equal to one. And that's gonna be our ellipse. So if we were to draw this ellipse out, oh, I'll do it right here on the left-hand side. It would look something like this, longer in the x direction and shorter in the y direction. Is it perfect? Nope. Uh, but that is gonna be square root of four, which is two for our uh, x direction, so it's going to vary between positive and negative 2 in the x direction. And up here for the y direction, well, that's going to end up being root 2, but that's not totally necessary to know to work through this problem. Well, so let's do, uh, let's do some vertical slices again. To generate this whole region, we're going to have to let that vary, that vertical slice vary from x is equal to negative 2 to x is equal to positive 2. So we have our x bounds, so we know that x varies between negative 2 and positive 2. Now we have to figure out what y is going to vary between. So once again, we take this and we solve it for y. Uh, oh, I don't know. Let's do this here. All right, so we've got y squared uh, is equal to well, let's not start with that. That's kind of an ugly one. You know, it's going to be much easier if we start with this. 2y squared is equal to 4 minus x squared square root both sides. And you get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared. So this top is going to be dictated by y is equal to, um, oops, let's divide by 2 like we should have. There we go. Divide by 2 first, then take the square root, and that'll give you the right answer. So this top is going to be 4 minus x squared over 2 under a square root. And the bottom is going to be y is equal to negative 4 minus x squared over 2, all in a square root. So here are our y bounds. Uh, that simplifies to 2 minus 1 half x squared. So let's do that. So now we're ready to put it all together. The volume of this region is going to be given by the following integral. Well, x on the outside, y in the middle, z on the innermost. So we'll just work from left to right. x varies from negative 2 to positive 2. And then y varies from negative square root of 2 minus 1 half x squared to positive square root of 2 minus 1 half x squared. And then z, as we saw before, varies between the lower value of x squared plus 3y squared and the upper value of 8 minus x squared minus y squared. And there's our integral. Is it a pretty one? Nope, but let's try it anyway. OK, so we'll tackle first our inner integral. And just as before, as you've seen me do, I like to do inner, outer, and middle, or inner, middle, and outer in that order. So the inner one, since we're just integrating the differential, is going to be z evaluated 
from z is equal to the lower bound x squared plus 3y squared to the upper 8 minus x squared minus y squared. So that's going to be 8 minus x squared minus y squared minus x squared plus 3y squared. This gives us 8 minus 2x squared, distributing that negative sign through, minus 4y squared. OK, so now we're on to the middle integral. OK, so this one, y varies between those positive and the negative roots. And this time we're going to integrate 8 minus 2x squared minus 4y squared with respect to y. That's going to give us 8y minus 2x squared y minus 4 thirds y to the third power evaluated for those bounds, which I'll run out of room if I, no, I won't. OK, now, if you're looking at that and thinking, whew, that's a, that's a lofty lift, turns out these integrals are, uh, there's a reason for cylindrical and, uh, as we'll learn, spherical coordinates here. They make some of these much nicer to work through. So there's a pretty heavy lift that goes on when you plug in these values for all your y terms. And there it is, that y to the third. And then simplify everything down together. But if you do, you will get 16 times 2 minus 1 half x squared minus 4x squared times 2 minus 1 half x squared minus 8 thirds uh, 2 minus 1 half x squared all raised to the third power, just the root, not the eight thirds part. And so we'll continue on with that. And that'll take us to our outer integral, which I'm going to write like this. So I'll go ahead and do that here. I'm going to say that, hey, um, this and this are common factors. I know it could even go further, but just for the purposes of the future, because I kind of know the spoiler alert on this thing, uh, let's do something sneaky. Okay, so we're gonna factor out that root. We're gonna have 16 minus four x squared times two minus one half x squared. And if you're any problem I ever ask you all to do, I'd, I'd give you some kind of a significant hint if this was required. But so for now, just let it be an example, 2 minus 1 half x squared, all under a root to the third power. And like I said, I know we could tidy that up, but we're just not going to. All right, so now we're on to our outer most integral. And here we go. Well, this one is in terms of x. x varies between negative 2 and positive 2. And we are integrating that expression that we just sort of algebra on the other page. And we're integrating with respect to x. So let's get our differential there. Well, we could algebra that and we could um, take it further, but I think I should have done more algebra on the prior page. Uh, yeah, let's just do it. Let's put a pin in this, do a little algebra. We're gonna tidy up our integrand and we'll come back to that. So our integrand, so far we have 16 minus four X squared times our root expression. minus 8 thirds. Well, a root to the third power gives us what was under the root. 
and then a single instance of what was under the root left under the root. Oh, no, 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 forgive me. I misread my notes. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you guys to do anything like this. So we're gonna go right on ahead and say, stick a pin in it. And instead of trying to follow our nose down some really relatively nasty algebra that isn't obvious uh, right away and would require a fairly sizable hint and walkthrough to get to, we're gonna just go ahead and say that do the algebra, do the integration, and you'll come up with eight pi root two. This is gonna be a little bit of a common theme for this lecture where occasionally I'm gonna leave this out and say, occasionally, it's all right to use technology to help us do this. Again, some of the homework problems may be challenging. If it requires any tricky methods, I'll give you a hint. I would never ask you to do anything quite this burly on an exam, this particular example. Uh, it takes like two pages to work out. So rather than a bunch of algebra and trigonometry that you've seen before and survived, let's do another slightly different example. Uh, there's a few blank slides here. Here we go, yeah. So well, this time we wanna do the volume of a solid bounded by some planes. The plane Z is equal to Y minus X and the coordinate plane Y equals one. And then Z is equal to Y and Z equals to zero. But before we do this, let's check out this GeoGebra link. If you notice, it says author Brian Abbott. That's a lie. This was come up by the other person, Joseph Manthe. I just made a copy of it so I could not lose it and keep track of it. So what we've been doing so far is integrating in the order of Z, Y, and X, just like this integral is shown right here. They've got an integral set up. It's over this region. We can see the projection down into space there onto the plane. Well, I guess, you know, if we were to do this better, we'd have it like that. There you go. There's your projection of the surface into the space of our uh, region and space down onto the plane and the usual orientation of the plane with X and Y being positive like we like them. Let's drag this into this orientation and let's just click these things. So first what you do is for every single point in that uh, projection down in the XY plane, you're going to generate a line like that. Okay, so that's if we take a single point and uh, look at our height. What happens for this middle integral if we keep that kind of line uh, fixed? Pick a y value and let that vary. Well, in this case, we would generate that, a single slice of area underneath this surface. And as we've seen before, if we let those go side to side in this x direction, we then are going to generate the entire volume under the curve. And as usual with calculus, this is just a sort of partition of it. And as you take that partition uh, to have more and more slices and let it go off to infinity, the number of steps you take, you get the actual integral. All right, with that in mind, let's try and not use tech and just sketch this thing and see what we come up with. All right, so what we're going to do here is set this thing up. Oh, I don't know, I'll give myself a little bit of room. I'll set it up right in the middle. So there's our Z axis. There's our Y axis, as usual, adhering to our right hand rule. And there's our X axis kind of sticking right out at us. Okay, so what are we told so far? Well, we're told that this thing is bounded by the, these planes. All right, so which one of these planes do we want to tackle first? Oh, I don't know. Let's just start with, let's start with this one. Z is equal to Y. And so to try and figure out what, what this uh, region is going to be, the solid that's bounded by this stuff is going to be, let's just sort of consider taking slices in coordinate planes. So I'm looking kind of straight at this flat, and flat in front of me is the YZ plane. And so if we let 
x equal to zero, if we let x be zero, then we're just looking at that y z kind of flat plane there. So let's let's graph what is y is equal to z going to look like in that flat x equals zero plane. Well, it's going to look like the perfectly diagonal line there. So we'll let that go and we'll say, all right, this is uh, a line and it's keeping x equal to zero. It's it's the line z is equal to y or y is equal to z. OK, so what's next? Um, well, after that, let's let's. Uh, let's take a look at this y equals one plane. Well, so that means we're going to head down here. And you know what? Let's go ahead and give ourselves some tick marks here. So we'll make this one on the y plane. And so we'll go ahead and do that in green. And so that's going to encounter. All right, that's going to. It's going to give us a vertical line like this. And since they meet right there, I'm going to not extend it further. But something I didn't say was, well, we chose for this purple guy, we let x equal zero, but you know, we could keep going and there would be copies of that line and it would generate a plane out like that. I'm not sure that's what happens, so I'm not ready to do that yet. But I think it might be helpful at this point to let this y equals one plane just kind of extend off in that direction. Yes, it goes backwards, but I am. I think that we're gonna we're gonna be okay with that here. All right, what's next? Um, well, z equals zero. Z equals zero down here. Well, that's just the x y plane. So, all right, this thing's bounded by the flat bottom plane. I'm not gonna draw that in just yet. So, all we're left with is this little guy. Y is or z is equal to y minus x. And say, so, okay, well, let's think about that. When in this plane, in z is equal to zero, right in the xy plane, that becomes zero equals y minus x. So it becomes y is equal to x. So we've got ourselves another kind of perfectly diagonal line. So that's going to intersect this green part of our y equals one plane, right like this. And that's going to tell us that this right over here is one. Additionally, I didn't mention it before, but z is equal to y and y equals one, that's gonna give us z is equal to one as well. All right, so we're starting to have something take shape here. So which one of these is gonna differ? Let's, let's return our thoughts to this plane and just say, okay, well, we, we just set z equal to zero, but what if we let y equal to zero? Well, if y was equal to zero, z would be equal to negative x. I don't think that's going to happen very nicely there. So, All right, I think the last thing I said was if y was equal to zero, then x, z is equal to negative x, and that would kind of be over here somewhere. So let's let's not do that. Let's just think. Uh, okay, well, what if what if uh, so y being zero, we let x equal zero. Well, then we would be back in this plane. So where is the Where's the intersection of that? Whoops. Where's the intersection of this purple plane and then this orange plane going to happen? So if x is equal to zero, then the orange plane becomes z equals y minus zero. So z is equal to y. So they're going to intersect right there at that corner. So I'm going to take this orange plane and I'm going to draw it right on up here and connect it right like that. And so I think I left off part of this problem statement as I sometimes do in that this thing is also bounded by the coordinate planes. Um, because yeah, otherwise we could let it keep going kind of back in the negative x direction. And that's not what I intended when I had this drawn in the paper. So bounded by this and the coordinate planes. We've got one of them in there with z is equal to zero but we'll include the other ones as well. Okay, so now we've got ourselves a relatively nice shape. It's kind of this little uh, three-dimensional uh, offset pyramid looking thing here. So let's try and label some of the things that we have so far, that we know so far. So this, this is the plane, y is equal to one. And this sort of this top of this little guy, um, this little thing, 
Let's see. This is the plane uh, Z is equal to Y minus X. And then Oh, what color is it? It's kind of purple. Let's go with purple. So this sort of, it's back there behind us is gonna be that plane x equals to zero. It's gonna give us the, the yz plane. And then on the bottom, I don't really want to label it, but it doesn't hurt too. We've got on the very base of this thing, that's gonna be the plane z is equal to zero. I'd say that's not a half bad picture. So which direction do we want to integrate this thing in? There are lots of different ways we can do this. I am going to choose to sort of imagine that I'm gonna take the top of one of my slices right there on the y is equal to one plane, and then I'm going to intersect it, or uh, the bottom of it is gonna be right there. So I haven't used blue yet, so I'll use blue. And so what we, we've got here is we've got what I'm going to call y top and y bottom. So now how what what projection are we going to need to let the points vary across so that we're going to generate all of these little individual slices, line segments that will make up the volume of this this entire region. Well, so what we're gonna have to do here is, I need this thing to be smaller. So since we're gonna let this thing vary across this plane, whoops, I guess that's kind of eroding my green, but I think you can still see it. The projection is going to be that plane projected down onto this YZ plane. And to see that, once I get this shaded in, let's go ahead and connect our slice with a point right there. Okay, so that gives us our point. So now we have another choice. Uh, I think we have our innermost integral. We definitely do. We've got the, the, uh, our y bounds. So what we're gonna do here, what we, our, the decision we made was we're gonna do dy first. It's gonna be our outermost integral. And so, so far, we want our y bound, or I'm sorry, our y bounds will be in terms of the other two variables, in terms of x and z, rather. And so for, let's draw this in blue, for y top, what we have is one, and then y bottom, we have that orange plane. We have y minus x is going to be our lower limit of integration. So now we've got our outermost integral set up, and the game now becomes to set up this. The I'm sorry, we have the innermost integral set up, and now the game becomes to set up the outer integrals, the outer double integral. And so what we're going to do is on the next page, we're going to set up an integral over that region in the x, z plane. So, and this is what I'm gonna call the projection double integral. And this is our outer. Okay, so let's draw our picture. Well, z being positive seems to make sense going that direction and x being positive seems to make sense going that direction. I know these things connect between one and one, so I'll go ahead and make my connection. And they're limited by the coordinate planes, so they're gonna stick right here in this sort of quadrant that we've drawn. And so far, all I've got is that one kind of point that connected to that thing. So I'm not gonna talk in terms of x and y, or z rather, but I'm gonna talk in terms of vertical and horizontal. So. I'm going to choose to set this thing up as vertical. Okay, so now we need to figure out 
if I let that thing, if I started it on the leftmost and let it vary all the way to the right, we've sure enough got our x bounds. So our x bounds are x less than or equal to one and starting at zero. So now we got to figure out what does our z value vary between. Well, so from the height, right down here at the bottom, you've got z is equal to zero. So we've got that part, but we need to figure out that. So what is that? All right, so I think the best way to do this is we not to do what I'm about to do. You can pop back to this page and try and figure out, okay, well, what is that? What are we, what are we, what is this? This our goal line that we're interested in on the other page is this right here. And so what is that line gonna be? I just don't, I don't know. It's not incredibly obvious. I think I might confuse myself. And so rather I'm just gonna go back here and say, hey, all I've really done is change the name of what I'm used to, y being the vertical axis and x being the horizontal. Uh, I've changed the name of z into uh, or y into z. And so I could think of that as y and say, okay, well, this is a this is just a negative line. That line we're interested in, the one I just highlighted red is that one. And so this is kind of a negative slope having line. And so this the slope of this line is negative one. So we've got negative um, negative one x, there's our slope, and then it's shifted up by one, so we've got plus one. So this, this z expression is one minus x, just to kind of tidy it up a little bit. And so, all right, sure enough, there's our red line, and that gives us our top height. That's going to be y, I mean, it's one minus x. And so now we can put this all together. We're ready to generate our actual integral. Okay, so for our outermost integral, I like to, you know, you've seen me do this before, kind of make my plan with my differentials so I don't get mixed up. Uh, x is equal to zero to one. And then y varies from, I think I'm gonna have to revisit the prior slide. Wait a minute, that's not what we did. That's not what we did, is it? Forgive the mistake. That's not what we want either. Our outermost integral, the point of this example was to start with a different order. So our outer integral was given on the prior page. We have one being the upper and y minus x being the lower. So we have for our innermost integral, getting myself all mixed up, sorry y'all. Okay, let's start from the inside. Uh, dy or innermost integral, y is equal to x plus z. And then y is equal to one. All right, I know I've got myself all mixed up. My notes have, my notes are correct. They have y is equal to x plus z as my lower limit of integration. But if we pop backwards, this blue is not, a, it's a mistake because it says very clearly, and it's right, you know, your y bounds can't have y in them and they need to be in terms of y and x. And that's in terms of y, uh, they need to be in terms of x and z for the y bounds. And that's in terms of x and y. And so we need to fix this. Well, what is that? The, it's the plane, the lower part of this right here is that plane and that plane is this equation. So we need to solve this thing for y. So we'll add x to both sides and we'll get y is equal to z plus x, which I'm gonna write as y is equal to x plus z, because I think we all kind of have the habit of putting them in alphabetical order. And that will fix our problem and alleviate my confusion. Okay, now we're ready to put together our double integral. Now that we have our inner integral together, we need to look over here and say, well, what order of integration are we gonna do? Well, I can start with my outermost one, that's x, and that tells me that x is gonna vary, and that means that I've narrowed it down. I've got the z in the middle, which we see right there. So we're gonna let z vary from zero to one minus x, and then we're gonna let x vary from zero to one. Okay, we set up that integral and we could do it and we will do it in a minute, but first things first, let's try and set it up a different way. So quick sketch.
all our tick marks at the one in all the directions. Go ahead and draw our vertical line there and then our diagonal line there. And then let this extend out and then connect that. And then connecting these two, we've got our region in space. Now this time, I want to take my slices. I want to make them kind of vertical. I'm going to start in that base, and then I'm going to come up and hit the height of this plane right here. So if I were to do this with a highlighter, I might highlight this base as green to match what we did before. And then since I used orange before for this upper plane, I'm going to use orange here to kind of highlight that orange plane to show what I mean. I'm going between those two planes. And so let's label this. In orange, we have the plane z is equal to y minus x. And then down here in green, which is a change from before, we're going to have this be z is equal to 0. Now putting this together, the top and bottom of that little line segment for my z bounds are going to be over here. Now, since there's z bounds, they should be in terms of the other variables. So z is equal to y minus x, and z is equal to 0. Give us our upper and our lower bound for z. Now we need to worry about our projection. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw that projection out. This time, it's in the xy plane, and so it's kind of what we're used to. And so I'll just take that and I'll sketch it over here. This is x, this is y, this is 1, this is 1. All right, so we're sketching this little picture here. Go ahead and highlight that green so it matches what we have. And let's generate some slices. This is the y is equal to x diagonal line. And that is given by y is equal to 0. So putting it all together, if we let x vary from 0 to 1, we'll generate this whole place. And y from 0 to x. All right, working from, in this case, I'm going to work from the inside out. I'm doing first my z boundaries z is equal to 0, and z is equal to y minus x dz. Now I'm ready to do the double integral, the outer integral, and that is going to be dy in the middle and dx on the outside. So we'll go from x equals to 0 to x equals to 1, and then we'll go from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to x, and we've got ourselves another way to do this integral. Now on the next page, let's go ahead and work them. And the first one I'm going to do is the one we're looking at right now. So we're going to do this one. All right, I paused it so you didn't have to watch me rewrite that. But now we're ready to tackle the integration. So our inner integral, well, once again, we're just integrating the differential, so it's going to be z evaluated from z is equal to 0 to z is equal to y minus x. That's going to give us y minus x. Next, we're going to do our middle integral. And that is the integral from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to x of y minus x. What we just found, our, our inner integral becomes the, inter the result of the inner integral, just like before, double integrals becomes the integrand for our next iterated integral. So integrating with respect to y gives me 1 half y squared minus xy. We're going to evaluate this from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to x. Well, the y is equal to 0 is not going to give us anything. What this is going to give us is it's going to give us 1 half. So I thought I had done right, and I realized I've made a huge mistake. And so sometimes when you do a huge mistake, you just got to start over. And that's where we're at. So I'm going to erase some stuff and come back to this, and we're going to redo the projection bounds.
Okay, so let's uh, try this again, but this time let's let's do it right. So be careful when you're drawing these pictures. It's very easy to make a mistake as you just saw me do. All right, so now let's uh, use colors here. Y is equal to one on this line. It's gonna be related to Y is equal to one here. And in the flat plane there, Y is equal to X is gonna be related to this line. And then that Y axis back there is just still happily the Y axis. And so now we can highlight which portion we're interested in. We're interested in this portion. So now we're gonna slice this rig from here to here. Now, a lot of the things we said before are still true. This is still Y is equal to X, but this is now Y is equal to one and that's gonna affect our top and bottom bounds. We're still gonna let X vary from zero to one, but now Y is gonna vary not from zero to X, but rather now Y is equal to X is our bottom and Y is equal to one is our top for that slice. And with that fixed, we can go fix our integral. And so that doesn't change our initial innermost integral, it'll change our middle integral. And so we'll start that one again. Y is equal to X to Y is equal to one and the y minus x is gonna become our integrand, which we will do with respect to y. That's going to give us one half y squared minus xy evaluated from y is equal to x to y is equal to one. So this is gonna give us one half minus x when we uh, plug in y equals equal to one. And then it's gonna give us one half x squared minus xy, replacing the y with x is gonna give us x squared. Okay, resuming a little bit of, uh, after a little bit of algebra, we can tidy this up to be one half minus x plus one half x squared. That's our new integrand. So now it's time to do our outermost integral. Our outermost integral is the integral from z equals to zero to z equals to one of one half minus x minus one half, man. I am sorry, oh, x equals, x equals. It's right up there. Why did I, yep, because I was looking at the innermost one. Okay, and now we've got to get our uh, differential. It's the outermost integral, so it's gonna be dx. This is gonna give us one half x minus uh, one half x squared plus, oh wait, that's why is the, because I foolishly, this, uh, this plus became a minus down here. So let's fix that plus, there we go, plus one six x to the third. We're gonna evaluate this from x is equal to zero to x is equal to one. Well, since they all have x's in there, that zero is not gonna contribu contribute anything. And the one is gonna give us one half minus one half. Now that's gonna nicely go to zero plus one six. And so we get a full on answer of the volume of this rig is one sixth of a unit cubed. Okay, now I'm gonna to attempt to do this in the other direction. So our integral is now integral from x is equal to zero to x is equal to one. But now we're gonna have z as our middle integral and it's going to be z is equal to zero to z is equal to one minus x. And then that leaves us with y, uh, y, and y is gonna go from x plus z to one. We get our differentials in there and we're good to go. Inner integral, we're integrating nothing one with respect to y. So we're just going to get y evaluated from y is equal to x plus z to y is equal to one. That's going to give us one minus x plus z. So might as well one minus x minus z. Write a lot, uh, don't do anything in my head, make fewer mistakes. Now we're about to do our middle integral. Well, this integral is the integral from z is equal to zero 
to z is equal to one minus x. Our integrand is gonna be what we just found. And we're integrating with respect to z. That's going to give us z minus x z minus one half z squared evaluated from z is equal to zero. And since every term has a z being multiplied in it, that'll give us nothing. And what we have to worry about is evaluating it for z is equal to one minus x. This is going to give us one minus x minus x times one minus x minus one half times one minus x quantity squared. That's going to give us one minus x minus x squared plus Oh, slow down. All right, so we're distributing this out. We get minus x plus x squared minus one half times one minus two x plus x squared. All right, continuing on, we've got one minus two x plus x squared minus one half plus x minus one half x squared. Now, what can we do here? We can tidy that up further as one half x squared minus x plus one half. And we've done it, we've done our middle integral. Now, last but not least, we've got our outer integral, which I'm gonna try and squeeze on here because I think it's gonna work. And we're gonna go from x is equal to zero to x is equal to one. We're going to integrate this expression one half x squared minus x plus one half with respect to x, which is going to give us one sixth x squared minus one half x squared plus one half x. Evaluate that from x equals zero to x equals one. And once again, Every term has an x expression being multiplied, so the zero will give us nothing. So we just have to evaluate this thing for one. That's gonna give us one sixth minus one half plus one half. Once again, those will add to zero and we'll get the same result as we should. Okay. A few blank slides we may or may not have needed. And now we're on to the average value of a function. So you can find the average value of a function f over a domain d, and that's given by one divided by the volume of domain d times the triple integral of f over the domain d. So let's set up and work an example. The temperature at a point of a solid d bounded by the coordinate planes and 9x plus y plus z equals 1 is given by t is equal to xy plus 8z plus 20 Celsius. Find the average temperature over this solid. So if it's bounded by the coordinate planes, it's going to be in the sort of first octant with x, y, and z positive. So at least I think so. At least I, I know so with respect to this secondary bounding thing. So we've got this right there in the usual orientation. And now to figure out this out, I think a good idea would be to figure out what are our vertices gonna be. So along the y-axis, x and z are gonna be zero. So you're gonna have zero plus y plus zero equals one. All right, so we've got, there's a vertex at one on the y-axis. Similar logic when x and y are zero gives us that the vertex is going to be z is equal to one, not plus, but rather one. And now on the x axis, when y and z are zero equal to one, we have nine x equals one. So it's going to be x is equal to one ninth. All right, so we'll make that one ninth. That's not very much to scale, but that's okay. It's just a picture to get us thinking and see what we're doing. And so if this is bounded by the coordinate planes, then we can just connect all these and get another one of these well, that's not a very con good connection. I want that to be a little, little better. Connect all these and get ourselves another sort of prism shape. And so, again, you can set this up however you like to, but, but I think I'm going to do it like this. I think I'm going to start right down here in the xy plane, z equals zero, and then I'm going to intersect it with 
this top kind of what I'm going to call the diagonal plane there. And so our z min, our, our z bounds, dz first, we're just going to write that as dz. And so z is going to vary. Well, so z minimum is the xy floor, and that happens when z is equal to zero. So what's the top of this going to be? What's the, the top of that height, little line segment there? But to figure that out, what are we given? That is, let me try and so this, not the plane behind it, but this, this kind of plane right here is given by this. And so what do we know? We know 9x plus y plus z is equal to 1 dictates the top of my slice there. And so by solving for z, I've got it in terms of x and y. And I want my z bounds to be in terms of the other two variables. So z is the max height z is going to attain is limited by 1 minus 9x minus y. So we're good to go in the z direction. Now we just need to figure out our xy bounds, the projection bounds. And so that is going to be, let me try and highlight this kind of, it's going to be that little base triangle right there. And this time I'll be extra careful when I draw this so I don't make the same mistake of getting the wrong region. So x is off in this direction, that's 1 ninth. And then y is off as usual into this direction for our projection. And that's going to be up there at 1. Connecting those, we've got our region drawn. Might as well color it in. OK, so now, as usual, I'm going to take vertical slices and let these slices vary from left to right to generate my bounds. So that means that x is going to vary from 0 to not 1, but rather 1 ninth. And y is going to vary between, well, it's starting off at y is equal to 0. And this line here, a little bit of old school algebra, will tell us y is equal to negative 9x there. So we're going to let this thing vary um, between 0 and negative 9x. Oh, that's not right. It's nine, negative 9x plus 1. Sorry. That's right. Negative 9x would go through the origin, shift it up by 1. That'll let it hit one on the y-axis. OK, so now we're after the average value. OK, so average value is equal to, well, I'm going to name this thing d. And that is d. d is the solid in three space uh, bounded by those things. And so our average value function is going to look like this. The triple integral over d, which we just established the bounds of, uh, of our t of x comma y comma z function over the triple integral of d uh, dv. I meant to put dv up there as well because we're not uh, really noting what it is. And the bottom is the volume because if you look back at the formula, one over the volume of d, well, what is the volume of d? The volume of d is just the triple integral over d integrating the volume differential. So this whole expression can be rewritten as triple integral of d of some function f over the triple integral of over d of just the volume differential. So now we could chase our way through this. And I'll let you in on a spoiler alert. We're not going to. But we are going to set up the integrals like diligently and nicely. OK, so the first thing we said was we were going to do things in terms of z. So z is going to vary, and we're going to integrate this temperature function here. So our integrand is going to be xy plus z, which is being multiplied by 8, plus 20. That's going to be with respect to z. Then x varies from left to right last, so that will be our outermost integral. That means dy is on the inside. And z varies from 0 to 1 minus 9x minus y. y varies from 0 to negative 9x plus 1. And x varies from 0 to 1 9. So that's our numerator. And then our denominator is going to be these same limits of integration in that same order of integration.
and we've got it. Now we're going to harness technology because this thing gets pretty ugly pretty fast where you're having to take like third powers of uh, expression trinomials expressions three things added together and whatnot and while we could do it we're going to use technology so here's an example of how you can use tech to solve these things um, all right so let's put this in projection mode so it's a little easier to see All right, and to finish this out, um, you see we've typed in these. I've named them D and N for numerator and denominator respectively. And then Desmos is a nice feature where you can call and reference those things that you define to be N and D. So numerator divided by denominator gives us our answer that the average temperature uh, over that domain region is 22.005 repeating degrees Celsius. And that brings this to an end.